investing used to look a bit like this. You know, this market has been on a tear, really, all year long. Sitting at $224 billion in market cap, year to date, the stock is up by 188%. But the mania has gotten even bigger, and options activity has been through the roof, stock activity has been through the roof. But if you want to, if they want to change the rules of the game now, because the general public is making money, after decades of the shorts crushing thousands of stocks into the dirt. And this setup, Strange, bizarre, is absolutely perfect for them. Sixty-nine million. I think it probably means digital art is here to stay. I'm going to Disney World. <laughs> Why wouldn't you want to own stocks at a time like this? He's in question, isn't it? And after that wild ride, 2022 happened, and I think it's fair to say that things got a bit less exciting. We saw valuations come back down to earth, meme stocks crash once again, and NFTs became about as valuable a sand in the desert. 2023 has started off fairly well, but only in the last couple of weeks we've seen the near collapse of the entire banking sector with everything that's happened with Silicon Valley Bank, Credit Suisse, and many, many more to come. Anyway, I wanted to make this video to show you that I think investing is about to get very boring again, or at least not as exciting as you might have seen compared to the last couple of years. Let me explain why, and then you can let me know at the end if you think we're heading to a boring old world or an even crazy one than we've already seen. Okay, look, the past few years and even the last decade has seen an almost unstoppable rise for investors. In fact, if we take the S&P 500 as our benchmark, and then we use this as a good way to show the returns of the stock market, check this out. Since the global financial crash in 2009 and running all the way up until around 2022, the market returned on average 14% per year for a stretch of time over more than a decade. Now, Many regular investors will know that this level of making money in the market is way above long-term averages, which sit around 9% when we look back at more than a century's worth of returns. Now, this is important, I think, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, almost everyone who watches my videos, at least, is around the age where our investing journey started after the crash, or maybe just a bit inside of it. So all we've really known is good times. The stock market's gone up into double digits multiple times, and then inside of that, loads of individual companies have crushed it, especially when we think about those big tech names that sit right at the top, like Apple, Amazon, Google, and many, many more. So our expectations as investors is pretty high, and we're used to seeing our portfolios grow year after year, and if there are any drops, they don't last very long. It's felt like one big, long party. Now, as a second point, we know that this has been fueled by easy and cheap money. And since the great financial crash, interest rates set by central banks were set at all-time lows, virtually zero in most cases. And when money is cheap to borrow or almost free, it pushes all of us to take that money and buy things, whether they're investments like the stock market, houses, cars, you name it. If you want a longer-term perspective, here on screen now, I'll show you the average interest rates both here in the UK and over in the US from the 1970s. In the UK, our average rate was around 7.12% for that period, and over in the US, the average rate was 5.42%. Now, interestingly enough, the lowest levels ever seen have been from the modern day. I mean, take the US for example. They hit a record low of 0.25% in December 2008. And we've only really seen this go up over the past year or so, and everyone seems to be losing their minds because somehow these normal rates are just apparently way too high. Now the big question is, if we enter into this more normal world where interest rates sit around 4 to 5%, do we have to pull back those expectations and go back to a much more normal time in the stock market? Or does normal not really exist and is it something that's always just changing? Like, for example, we have to remind ourselves that investing is now easier than ever before and it's very different from just a decade or so ago. If you're like me, you'll remember that the best thing you used to be able to do on a phone was playing Snake on your Nokia 3210 or maybe even a few generations before that. Or if you're lucky, you might even text a couple of mates until you ran out of text. Then you'd have to call them up before hanging up so then they could call you and use their minutes instead. Those are the days. Anyway, now you can open up your phone, get your favourite investing app and buy shares in companies from pretty much anywhere in the world. These are not normal times. If we look at how popular trading and investing became over the past couple of years, it's no surprise to see stock market valuations and volatility go up. We've had platforms in the US like Robinhood, which attracted millions of mainly young, first-time investors into the stock market by making trading easier than ever. In fact, if you check this out, at their peak, they had more than 20 million people trading actively in the middle of 2021. I think we can guess all the kinds of things they were buying, everything from GameStop, AMC to Tesla. 
To put this into perspective, the adult population in the US is something like 250 million people. So at its peak, we're getting close to 1 in 10 adults in the US trading and buying stocks on a single platform. And likewise, here in the UK, we saw massive growth in platforms like Free Trade, Trading212, and many more, where we all joined in on the frenzy and bought and sold stocks because apparently the fun was never going to end and it was just easy money. Now, as you can see, things cooled off almost exactly in the same downtrend as the stock market took through 2022. And in typical retail investor fashion, when stocks go down, they start to sell, which is the complete opposite of the buy the dip mentality that had taken hold just 12 months before. And I think here's where we can learn our first lesson, and it's the big difference between trading and investing. And there's this big gap there because trading is a short-term thing and it's you up against someone else, whereas investing is this long-term thing which is slow and by all means boring. In the short term, trading can look like it's an easy game with everything just goes up. All you have to do is buy anything and sell a day, a week, or even a month later, and you're in the money. Now, investing in the old fashioned way, at least using index funds and mutual funds, only works slowly over really long periods of time. And nobody's interested in that when the stock market is pretty much on fire, especially when you can see stocks like Tesla rise 10 or even 20 times in just a short space of time. The issue is, of course, the good times have to end and everything returns back to the average eventually. This is a really interesting thing I came across a while ago. I think I mentioned it in a video once, but apparently back in 2013, there was a study done by the investment company Fidelity, and they looked at how their customers' investments had done over the past 10 years. Some of the findings I think were really interesting. Now, what most of us might think is a good tactic, buying and selling stocks, buying on the dip, and generally trying to be smart, sounds like the right thing to do. You can imagine that during that time period, we had a huge opportunity to buy some cheap stocks right after the global financial crash. So smart investors should have been licking their lips, and those who were most active would have won, right? Well, the results were quite the opposite. So we don't actually have the real data, unfortunately, just secondhand sources. But the takeaway point was that those investors who did the best were inactive on their account, had their assets frozen, or they were dead. The best investors were not even on planet Earth and beat all of the rest. How boring. You see, I don't think there's any getting away from this point, and there's loads of data to back this up, that the real way to build wealth in the long term in the stock market is just channeling your inner sloth. You have to sit there, forget about it, and just keep making those investments into quality assets. And hopefully you do this while you're alive, but I suppose if you did set up a direct debit and just leave it, with enough time you could technically invest from the grave. Won't be much fun though. Speaking about being a sloth and investing without thinking about it, I read this book recently called 100 Baggers. It's another one well worth picking up if you aren't sick of my book recommendations already. And as the name suggests, this book covers all of those amazing companies on the stock market that have 100 times their original share price to give you that magic return of 10,000% on your money. So in cash terms, if you put in £10,000 or $10,000, that would turn into $1 million or pounds. Pretty nice if you can get them. Now, the reason why I think this fits in with this video and reminded me to grab it was that there are a few things that these companies have in common. Nothing to do with the kind of industry, what they sell, or if they sell goods or services, whether in the healthcare or whether they're in tech. The common theme between many of these companies was in fact that turning your share price into a return of 10,000% was both very rare and it takes a long time. Here on page 47, if I can show you this on screen now, it's an average, and you'll see that most companies took between 16 and 30 years to do it, if ever at all. And there were, of course, some outliers, but we're now talking about just a handful who managed to do it in 10 years or less from tens of thousands of public companies. Now, for example, on this list were people like Dell Computers, Cisco Systems, Home Depot, and the famous Monster Energy. But the key thing that's worth pointing out here is that in order to get those returns, you had to be in them at the right time. And not only that, you had to be in them for a really long time. And during that time period, even with the best performers, you're likely going to see your investment jump all over the place, sometimes dropping 10, 20% or even more along the way. Now, an emotional investor, or really just a normal investor, might not be able to put up with that and just sell out during those downturns. Whereas the boring investor, who's just not interested, is the one who wins, as they can just ignore everything and carry on regardless. Just a word of warning though, that's not to say that you just hold on to any stock for the long run and you'll get great returns, far from it. In fact, the vast majority of companies will not return you any more than the wider return of the stock market that you could get from good old index funds. Just going back to Monster Energy, honestly, would you expect a drinks company that makes caffeinated drinks to be one of the fastest growing companies in the world? 
And could you have held on during multiple periods of years when the stock did nothing, or if anything went down? I guess the question is, are you boring enough? So look, there's a couple of things going on here. One, I wanted to go back and revisit those key principles of investing that says really, for anything good to happen, we've got to leave it for a very long time. And many of you will already know this, as compound interest only works when you leave it. And good old Charlie Munger did say that we shouldn't interrupt it unnecessarily. After all, alongside Warren Buffett, Charlie's managed a pretty impressive return. And funny enough, Berkshire Hathaway is a 100 bagger too. And it took them 19 years to do it. That's a fun fact. I'll end up winning one of the pub quizzes. Anyway, remember that fact. But secondly, I'm not trying to pretend that during the last 20 years or so, we've not had plenty of challenges or global events that have really shaken things up and changed the world forever. But I will say that it's not really the events that matter, it's more how we choose to react to them as investors. You see, another massive thing that's taken place alongside being able to invest on our phones is that the news that comes along with it and all the financial headlines. We've now got more data than ever before and unfortunately, just like here on YouTube, the headlines with the scariest names are the ones that get the most views. We're not interested in the boring, we want the extremes. The perma bears who say there's going to be a crash next week in the stock market, we want the worst case scenarios. And now and then, we also want the bulls to give us that lovely confirmation bias that says our choice to invest in that one stock right now was the best decision we could ever make. Here's a couple of lines from the 100 Baggers book that explains what you need to do from page 183. There is a world of noise out there. The financial media is particularly bad. Every day something important happens, or so they would have you believe. They narrate every twist in the market, they cover every Fed meeting, they document the endless stream of economic data and reports. They give a platform for an unending parade of pundits. Everybody wants to try to call the market or predict where interest rates will go or the price of oil or whatever. My own study of 100 baggers shows that what a pathetic waste of time this all is. It's a great distraction in your hunt for 100 baggers. To get over this, you have to first understand that stock prices move for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes stocks make huge moves in a month, up or down, and yet the business itself changes more slowly over time. So is investing going to go back to being boring with interest rates getting back to normal, no more cheap money, no more back-to-back double-digit stock market rallies, no more valuations of hype stocks with no profits making it to multi-billion dollar unicorn status. And then finally, are expectations as investors coming back down to earth to the point where the stock market no longer excites us and we just stick to investing in index funds? You know what? If that's investing, then it can get as boring as it likes. What do you think?